Okay, welcome to the course. So I'm feeling a little better. Sorry, I was not able to teach last week. Which means that we have to change a little bit the schedule. Which means there will be a course next Wednesday morning. Okay. And a course during this smart week. Yeah, that's unfortunate, but uh, it's unpredictable. Okay. So I want to finish discussing the magic of lazy evaluation. But it's not all the magic. There's going to be more magic later on algorithms. So lazy is actually very, very powerful. What I want to do, I want to start by completing something from last time. So last time I showed producer-consumer, but there was uh, something unexpected. In fact, there's a, there was a missing paradigm. So I updated the slides, and it's better. The way I show it now is with four paradigms, not with three, and that gives you a much better so I will explain this. Then I'll talk about lazy suspensions, lazy deterministic data flow. This is the most powerful one, and I'll show you how to do a bounded buffer. The code is very simple, but it's very uh, useful to think exactly how it works. Okay? This is a, a very powerful, simple program. And then I'll give lazy quick sort. This is almost uh, kind of a, mir a miracle. This is where lazy evaluation will actually invent an algorithm. So remember, lazy evaluation only evaluates something when you need it. So it can turn a big computation into lots of small computations. Each time when you do, you need it. If you do that with quicksort, the result is very, very amazing. It's very smart. The algorithm is incredibly efficient. Uh, the efficiency is n plus k log k. So if I sort an, a list of n elements, normally it's n log n. But in the lazy version, the, the sorted list appears incremental. So you can ask for the first element, second element, and so on. And you can ask for k elements. So if I have a list of n elements, if I ask for k elements, the k smallest elements out of n, OK? If you do the non-lazy version, you have to do the whole quick sort, n log n. But in the lazy version, you have to do only n plus k log k. So that's much, much smaller. And what's really amazing, yes? Uh, is that uh, possible, uh, uh, such a lazy version uh, for over uh, sorting algorithm? Sorry? Uh, is that possible, uh, uh, a lazy version for over uh, sorting? Uh, so for other sorting algorithms? Yes. Well, that's a good question. Is this magic also possible? Probably it is. But I didn't uh, study it. You could, for example, okay. probably make it work for merge sort okay. or for others, but not for all sorting algorithms. Okay. Okay. The algorithm the, it works for lazy quick sort because it's divide and conquer okay. algorithm, and the lazy will only conquer the part that has to conquer and not the other part. Okay. Okay. But we we will get back to that when I show the algorithm. Huh? So what's really amazing is that the K is not known in advance. This is a subtlety. That means when I run the algorithm, I maybe don't know how many I need. Maybe I'm asking for elements until I get a certain one that I want. And I only know it when I'm looking at the elements. So even if you don't know the value of K in advance, you get this complexity. So it's really a very, very efficient algorithm, okay? And that is one of the things that laziness can do for you. It can really improve the algorithmic behavior, okay? So it's really very powerful. People don't realize the power of this approach. So hopefully you will see some of the power. And then I will talk about more general. So we have seen five paradigms of declarative programming, 
some of which are very powerful and current lazy. But I want to give you a precise definition. What is it now actually declared to programming? Okay? And in order to do that, I will actually give you a small introduction to first order logic. Okay? The notion, logical notions, where you have logical formulas that are true or false. And then what's called a model. A model is a, a, a structure in which the formulas are true or false. This is, lets you understand really what's going on. Okay? Unfortunately, there's no more course on logic. I used to teach a course on logic, but we have only a fixed number of courses. So the course of calculability gives you an introduction to logic. But not, it doesn't give everything, unfortunately. So I will give you a small introduction to force order logic, because that's important. It's important to understand a little bit about logic. And this will help us understand what is declarative programming. Okay? Okay, first, a few seconds of respect for the Ukrainians who are fighting for their freedom in the house. So let me first now give a Uh, summary. I won't go over, over everything here. Let me mostly give it as a in diagram on the blackboard. Now you can run, you should run the code. That last time I ran some of this code, there's a producer and consumer code here. Okay? So we had we had uh, a producer and a consumer. This one was generating a stream, uh, which contains elements from 1 to 10. 1 to every 100 millisecond per element. And the consumer was then computing the running sum of this and outputting a stream. Okay? So this is a simple pipeline uh, to show what the kind of things you can do. So let me now show you how this runs in four paradigms. Let me now give a, a more uh, a more formal explanation of what happens. So in sequential functional programming, we have sequential functional programming plus single assignment. This is a small change, but it's very important. We had deterministic data flow. And then we had lazy evaluation. So there's, these are four ways that you could run that code. Okay? So how does this work? So here we have a stream, which I will call S1. You will have a stream which you call S2. Okay? So I have updated the slides to be agreement with this. So the slides from the previous lecture are not complete. So I put a new set of slides that is important. So you see, every year I when I notice something missing, I try to improve it. So these are the four paradigms. So sequential functional programming. So this is Traditional function language. There's no unbound variables, no single assignment. And there are many languages that do this. For example, Lisp, Scheme, ML, OCaml, which are still still used, even though they're not so much mediatized. There are still communities using these. Then we have sequential functional programming with single assignment. This is important because list functions become table cursors. So this is a very an extra power. Then we have deterministic data flow, which is a concurrent form of functional programming with threads, data flow synchronization. So this one is used by many cloud analytics tools, okay, based on MapReduce and so on. So this is, is actually widely used, even though people don't say it so loudly, but it is very widely used today. And the final one, which we talk about in this lecture, is lazy evaluation, which is only adding one small concept 
for the data flow, which is the weight needed operation. So it's almost the same, it's just one extra concept. Nothing else, huh? there's no other magic okay, to this. So all of the techniques I showed you are possible with that. And there are also languages on this. The most popular one is called Haskell. This is a, a lazy functional language. And then there is a precursor of Haskell called Miranda. And there might be, there's other ones that are more research languages. But Haskell is actually also very popular, even though you don't hear it so much in the media. For example, there is a, a cryptocurrency company called IOG, which makes a blockchain called Cardano and a cryptocurrency called Theta. And that is a Haskell house. Those guys are all doing it in Haskell. So they don't say it so much, but they are a very mostly programming it in Haskell. So Haskell is actually a player in the cryptocurrency community, and it is a basic functional language, okay? So these languages are actually used quite a bit for very powerful kinds of, kinds of software. Okay, so that was just an introduction. Now this is something we did not see in the last lecture. So this is the paradigm that I, that I forgot in the last lecture. So if we have a traditional sequential functional program with no single assignment, okay? So there is no unbound variables. So how do we have to slightly rewrite the code in OS because OS will by default use the unbound variables to make it uh, tail recursive. But if I do like this, if I do the recursive call, prop2, L plus 1H equal S, S is not unbound, it's a value, it's the result, and the result is L bar S, okay? The low value followed by the rest. So both L and S here are bound values. There's no unbound variables. So how will this thing run when you run it? So I run it here, so I browse S1, S2, and I run it here, prod2 followed by con. Okay? The prod2 will not return anything until it is complete. So if I, when I call prod2, it will do a recursive call here, but the result is only computed when this recursive call comes back, okay? which means at the very end. That means the execution will be batch, batch. So there will be uh, 10 seconds of waiting, and then S1, and then prod2 will return, and then S1 is displayed completely. Uh, one, two, three, to ten, and the S2. So they will be displayed immediately after ten seconds. <coughs> because the cons has no delay. Yeah? Prop 2, notice it has a one second delay for each other. So the execution takes ten seconds. And once the ten seconds is done, then it returns. So this one you can you can execute. Okay. So this is what happens when you have no single assignment. It's one after the other. Okay. Now the second paradigm, this is what I started with last time. This is actually more, uh, more already more powerful because it's going to be tail recursive. Okay. So this function here, this return value is tail recursive. So let me explain how it works. So this is the return instruction, but in the kernel language, it's actually it's actually uh, compiled like this. Let me show you how it works. Prod L H, and this is the result. So 
the way this one works, the second one, the thing of assignment, is that this is the recursive call. In the current language, it's compiled like as follows. So this part here, I won't show you the rest. I'm only showing you this part. Okay. Now notice what happens is R is the result here. And the result is bound to L bar R1. And R1 is the recursive call. And then I do the recursive call. That means while this thing is being executed, the result is already being bound during the execution. And what that means is that S1, new element every second. Uh -huh. So this is incremental. Okay. S2 will be batch uh, everything after 10 seconds. Nothing before. So is that, can you see it? I don't want the computer to. Is, it, is the video camera seeing this? Oh, uh, yes. Okay. So this is what I would call a batch execution. So this is incremental. Okay, here they, in the previous case, they are both batch. Batch means you have nothing for a long time, and then you do everything at once. So here you wait 10 seconds, and during the 10 seconds you have nothing. Here, every second, you have a new element appear on S1. But S2 is nothing. And when S1 is completely done, then we will execute S2. And it's because the thread, there is only one thread here. So this thread is inside here. So while prod one is executing, the thread is here. So the const is not executed. Now only when this one is completely finished will you start the const. Okay? So that means that S1 will be incremental, but S2 is on this batch. Okay? And the reason why S1 is incremental is because of the single assignment. And it's the same reason why that this is tail recursive. Okay? So that's the second one. So in the last lecture, I did not show the difference between these two. Huh? So I noticed actually there was a, uh, something missing. So now it's complete. Huh? And then the third one. The third one is deterministic data flow. Now both S1 and prod and comps will execute in their own threads. That means while the prod is creating its elements here, the comps will already execute in its own thread. So there's multiple threads here. So this one will execute like before, huh? but it will not block the comps because this is executing its own thread and the comps also. Okay? Otherwise, it's exactly the same code. So the third one, we have S1 is incremental, and S2 is also incremental. That means every second, you have a new element appearing in S1 and a new element in S2. From to two elements at a time. Okay? Because there's no delay in the comps. Huh? When the prod creates an element, the const is immediately able to execute, and it will generate its own element. So you'll have two elements at a time every second. So they're both incremental. So you can see the difference here, and the increased power. So here, they're both batch. Here, we have only one thread. So every thread is basically a unit of incrementality. Uh, you can see it like this. One thread is one unit of incremental execution. Okay? This is in, the, in this version here. Right? So now I have one thread executing everything. This is this number two. Right? This is one thread, which means the prod will be incremental, but since there's only one thread, the const is not executing, so it's not incremental. So we have incremental and batch. 
And then in the third one, we have two threads. And each thread will allow an incremental execution. So they will both be incremental. Okay? So that is the progression. So you see the power of deterministic data flow. Well, you can also see that the result is exactly the same. This is because of church roster, right? It's just that the, the deterministic data flow is much more incremental than the standard uh, naive sequential functional program. Okay? And a single assignment is like an intermediate step. Uh, if you do this, then you, all you have to do is add threads and everything becomes incremental, multi-agent. Okay? So that's the complete explanation of what we saw last week. But this is all just precursor to the fourth one, which is the lazy. So notice we still have exactly the same code as before. We annotate the producer and the consumer as lazy. And when you execute it, nothing. So S1 and S2 will be computed by me now. So they will also be incremental, but incremental by need. That means when I run this, nothing is displayed, okay, until I need the results. What does it mean to need the results? Well, the need is defined in terms of the weight function. So need is a thread does weight x. So that's the formal definition. So weight x is a synchronization that will block the thread until x is bound to a value. And if the thread does this, then we say x is needed. Okay, that's the definition. So if nobody is waiting on x, then x is not needed. We defined a procedure called touch. Okay? We defined a procedure called touch that does this to force the computation. So here the computation will only be done when it's needed. Okay? Okay, so that completes the explanation of what we saw the last time. No? So now it's complete, huh? So last time there was something something missing, but now it should be complete. Okay, so let me go on now. So last time we saw infinite lists. Now infinite lists is a new thing. It is not possible in deterministic data flow because deterministic data flow, this would be an infinite loop. No? The ints n, n bar ints n plus 1, looks like an infinite loop. But in lazy execution, infinite loops are not a problem. Okay, so this is definitely possible. So we showed that. And then we went into the hanging problem where we need to generate the numbers 2 to the a, 3 to the b, 5 to the c, in increasing orders. This is non-trivial because when a, b, c are increasing, the numbers will appear in any kind of order. So you want them in strictly increasing order. And in order to do that, you will create it incrementally with a stream. And the way is to, to have h be the result. And then you have 2h, 3h, and 5h, and you merge them together. You take the smallest element each time. Okay? And so these lists are unbounded. So that whenever you see an unbounded list, you should have a little alarm bell ringing in your head. That means you can do it lazy. Okay? So that means this is a very simple lazy program that uses two lazy functions. Lazy times, which is very easy, and lazy merge. Notice there is no middle here, right? These programs are both infinite loops, okay? But in the lazy execution, we don't care about the base case. There is no base case. The streams are potentially unbounded. So you see, it's a very nice way to program, right? You can see why people programming Haskell, they like it very much, okay? because they never have to worry about termination. That's a very interesting way of programming. Huh? So this is the whole program. Huh? You define the two functions, times and merge. And then you have one recursive expression. You see h is equal to 
some expression and which is also containing H. Okay. Okay, so we saw that last time. But let me now uh, explain a little bit more in detail how it actually runs to give you some more intuition. Because I told you there's only one new operation, which is when needed. So technically, semantically, it's not so different from regular functional programming. But the problem is you have many of these are connected together. Okay? So you have threads and weight needed. Huh? So the weight needed is the new thing. But the execution is actually very rich, even though you only have one new thing. So I want to show you this. So in order to do that, let me introduce a new concept called a lazy suspension. So, that, so I'm not adding anything to the model. Huh? I'm just looking at the model that we have, and I'm giving something a name. Okay. So when I have L2 equal times L13, remember in the semantics, it creates a thread that does weight needed. Okay. Well, this thing I will call. I'm going to call it a lazy suspension. Okay. Because the thread is suspended on weight needed, and I will make a diagram for this. A little L2 is there's a lazy suspension times L13 attached to L2. And this one will only be executed when I need L2. Okay? And if you make that, then the, the Hamming program, you can see you can write that expression like this. Okay? So if I run the program, it immediately creates five lazy suspensions. Okay? And they will all wait. Okay? So merge T2, M2 will only execute when you need M1. Merge and T3, T5 will only execute if you need M2. And so on. Times H3 will only execute if you need T3. So each one of them is sitting there and waiting until the variable is needed. Okay? And now, how do you get this thing to execute? Well, you have to force the need. You have to put in the need. So if I execute m1.1, that will cause the whole chain of execution. Okay? If I execute m1.1, the dot operation uh, wants the first field of m1, and there is an implicit weight in there. Okay? The dot the case and addition of so they have an implicit weight, and that will cause the body of merge T2M2 to execute. Now this body itself has a case statement, so let me show you now in a little bit more detail. So let's say I do this, browse M1.1, the dot operation will cause the lazy suspension attached to M1 to execute, so that's very easy, it means that the body of this function is executed now. So here's the body. Um, uh, I can go back and show you. Huh? So the body is just the body of the function huh? that you can see here. So the body is executed. Now the body has a case statement in it on T2 and M2. And it needs the first two elements of T2 and M2. So this will recursively activate See, it will activate T2, the lazy suspension on T2, and on M2. So here is there's a times H T2, H2, and a merge T3, T5 attached to these. And the case statement will just wait forever until these two are bound. So this is still a data flow of wait. Huh? But now I've activated the two other lazy suspensions. They will do their work, and they will eventually bind T2 and M2, and then the case statement so, I, so you notice there's the red one, I make it color. Time H2 in red, and the merge in green. So here again, I keep the red and the green. Huh? The body of times H2 is executed. So again, this body has also a case statement and so on. It does stuff, okay? Um, and the body of merge T3, T5 is executed again. And this merge will again activate two more of them. And eventually, things come back 
for the case, the original case, and it was still it just sits there waiting, and then it run, it executes. Okay. So here's the overall execution. So let me see if I can do a, a pen. So I need this. Okay. This will activate this merge. Then it will execute this. Then it will activate this. It will eventually come back. It will activate also this one. Then it will go like this. It will activate this one. It will come back. It will activate this one. Come back. So I'm trying to do my CPU figure show the mouse. It comes back here. And then this runs finally. And then finally it binds the one. So you see there's like a, a single flow of control here. Okay? It's actually an asynchronous execution. There is a single, the line is actually a single line. Okay? Whenever I activate, I go somewhere, I do something, and then I come back. I go somewhere, and then I come back. So the lazy execution is actually a kind of sequential execution. Okay? So even though it's defined between thread and weight needed, that, that's just the semantics. If you follow the flow, you can see it's actually sequential. Okay. So that gives you an idea of how the lazy execution is working. You see, it always, when I need something, it recursively goes upstream, and it goes up, 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 and then it eventually comes back down again. Okay? So that's just that you understand. Now, of course, you don't need to do to know this when you run the Hammond program. Huh? This is done automatically. Yeah? Okay. So now let's talk about the, the fifth paradigm. The latest deterministic data flow. So we have deterministic data flow, which is not lazy, and we have lazy, which is sequential. Now you see, the lazy is actually sequential. So there's actually, in a lazy execution, if you don't create threads, it's actually sequential. Uh, so technically, it's a form of co-routine, if you want to use uh, terminology, older terminology. But there's only one flow of control. Okay? So we've seen these four paradigms. Sequential with no single assignment. Sequential with single assignment. So this allows data structure with holes. This function is still recursive. Then deterministic data flow. Concurrent program with streams. So this allows multi-agent. So this is very popular nowadays. Uh, and lazy evaluation. This adds by need with weight needed. And allows program with an infinite data structure. That's a new thing. And there is language and there's languages that do this uh, for all of these. Now I want to show you the fifth paradigm, where you combine the threads and the lazy. So you see they're two different things. Huh? Lazy by itself is sequential. Huh? Okay. So lazy deterministic data flow is the most powerful one that we're going to talk about. So I want to give you some intuition how you program with this one. So what is the power? Well, it's confluent. That means the result is always the same. There's no race conditions, no non-determinism is visible. And it's higher order, of course. Of course, all of this stuff is higher order, though. It's also concurrent. Concurrency means that you can have multiple activities that are independent of each other. That means they're not actually lockstep. They can be out of sync with each other. Okay? And it has lazy evaluation, which means you only do computation when it's needed. So that's a lot of power, and it seems kind of complicated to use all that power. So what can we do with all this power? And I'll give you one example. We'll show step by step how you can use the power piece by piece. And we do, to do that, I'll show you a, a, a primitive thing called the bounded buffer. Okay. So a bounded buffer is a well-known concept. So I've mentioned it already in the previous lecture, but now we're going to show the code. Huh? So bounded buffers are used everywhere, but usually they're not implemented in a declarative way. Okay. Usually they're implemented in languages with mutable assignments, so they're not so nice. They're not, they're not declarative, so you have to be very careful when you use them in a concurrent setting, and you can have 
uh, race condition, and so on. So usually you have to be very careful. So this bounded buffer will be purely declarative. Okay? You don't need any kind of a mutable assignment to do it. Okay, so how does it work? So again, let's use some producer-consumer. Producer-consumer is very common, of course, in all kinds of computing systems. Uh, when one machine is sending something to another, it's almost always a stream or a pipeline. Okay. Now, there is some problem with this producer-consumer. And the bounded buffer solves the problem. The problem is that the producer and the consumer are not always running at the same speed. Okay. Uh, they can fluctuate because they do different things. The producer is producing elements, and maybe sometimes takes a lot of time. The consumer is consuming elements, which is very different. Okay? Uh, so sometimes one is faster than the other. So when the producer creates elements too quickly, it, 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 it has to stop. Because the elements are only created when the consumer is using them. Huh? So we're assuming this thing is is not using any memory. So when the producer is producing elements and the consumer is not consuming them, then the producer cannot consume, produce them because we have to store them somewhere and we're assuming that there's no extra memory. So the bounded buffer will be the thing that manages the extra memory. Yeah. So when the producer creates elements too quickly, the consumer cannot use them. So the producer stops and waits until the consumer is ready. Okay, That's the basic behavior. An opposite behavior is possible. The consumer needs an element right now. So it asks the producer for the element. So the consumer has to wait for the producer. So both of them are idling. They're waiting a lot. Okay, So that's not good. That's inefficient. Okay, So we want things to be smoother. And that is the problem solved by the bounded buffer. The bounded buffer is a component that you should put in the middle, in between the two, okay? And it helps both sides. So when the producer creates elements too fast and the consumer is not ready, then they're stored in the bounded buffer. So, so the bounded buffer keeps stuff. So it takes a certain amount of memory, yeah, which you can define. Uh, and if the consumer needs elements, well, it can take elements from the bounded buffer. So the producer can kind of get ahead of the consumer, put elements in the bounded buffer, and the consumer can take elements. And in the meantime, the producer can produce even more elements. So the execution is much smoother, and the idle time is much reduced. Okay? So the performance is improved. So it's very nice, huh? So the code, the code is not changed of the producer-consumer. And, and so it's an, an, kind of an invisible component. Uh, you stick it in there, <coughs> the code of the producer consumer is exactly the same as before. Okay? So we're going to program it. So both the producer and the consumer will be lazy. Okay? Basic functions. And we will put the bounded buffer in the middle. And to the producer, the bounded buffer looks like a consumer. It's giving elements. And to the consumer, the bounded buffer looks like it's producing elements. So they look the same as before. So the bounded buffer has like two, two faces. Huh? It looks like a producer on one side, it looks like a consumer on the other side. Okay? So even if the consumer does not ask for elements, the bounded buffer will ask for elements from the producer. It will consume elements even when the consumer does not ask for them. But it doesn't actually consume them, it just stores them up. But it asks the producer, that means it forces the producer to compute them. Um, and, and then they will be stored here, and when the consumer needs elements, the bounded buffer will produce them, even if the producer is not ready to produce new elements. Okay? Okay, we're going to write the code for this. So here we have a producer-consumer pipeline, which sort of looks like this. So I'm going to be run, I'll run the code for you in a bit. Though. So this is the typical producer-consumer. S is the stream. We have a producer agent and a consumer agent. So we're going to stick the bounded buffer in the middle. Uh, producer produces S1, and the 
consumer consumes S2, and the bottom buffer has S1 on one side and S2 on the other side. Okay. So we're going to define this procedure, bounded buffer, and 10 years the size of the buffer. So there's a certain maximum number of elements. So we can manage the memory. Huh? That's important to them. Okay. So we will define it step by step. And I will show you the reasoning process in terms of concurrency and laziness. So we'll start by something very simple, and then we will make it a little bit better and better step by step. Okay? So here is the, the first step. The first step is the bounded buffer doesn't do anything. So here we have procedure bounded buffer, S1, S2. S2 is equal to loop S1. And look at this loop function. It reads S1 and it outputs exactly the same thing. H1 bar loop 2. Okay. So here is the bounded buffer that just outputs the same elements as it inputs. That's basically what we want. Right? It's just the timing has to be a little different. Okay. Okay. So, so that is the first step. Is a bounded buffer that doesn't do anything yet, but it's like a transparent thing. So if you put this code between the producer and consumer, everything still works. Nothing has changed. Okay. Now the bounded buffer has two two phases. It has a startup phase and it has a a running phase. So when you start up the system, the bounded buffer will immediately ask for n elements. Okay? That means when I write, when I start the system, the bounded buffer tries, it, it always tries to be full. Okay? So when I start it up, it would immediately ask for n elements. So this is the following code. Okay? So this is very simple. Okay. So here we add a new function call. So this is coming from the list library. So I don't want to redefine anything. So list.drop. So list.drop is a library function that removes the first elements and elements from a list. So if I have the list L, which is one, two, three, four, then list.drop L2 will be 3, 4, so on. So it removes the first n elements. So that's strange, huh? But, but remember, we're lazy now, what? So list.drop is not lazy, yeah? It's immediately asking for these. So that means it's, it needs those n elements. Okay? It needs them, and so it forces S1, it forces the producer to produce them. This is lazy execution, huh? So calling this function will force the producer to produce n elements. So what does it do? So the, the stream S1, huh? the stream S1 will already be bound now. So we have here S1. So S1 will already now have n elements. Well, it will be in the, in the process of creating n elements. Huh? So we ask for that. Huh? S2 is still unbound, huh? because the, product, the consumer has not need anything yet. So on the startup, we will eventually achieve this. So the producer will start making elements. That might take some time, huh? but we're asking for n elements. The producer starts writing and it starts producing n elements. Okay? And because the, the stream is single assignment here, once we create these elements, they exist forever. So the consumer could start reading the elements, whatever, right? So once we create this part of the stream, then it's there and it will exist forever. Okay? So that's the start. Now, now we have to do the running phase. Now, assume the consumer asks for one element. So basically, it reads the first element. Fine. 
But if it does that, then there's only n minus 1 elements in the bounded buffer. Okay? So the buffer always tries to stay full. So that's the goal. So it's a kind of goal oriented. Huh? The buffer is trying to stay full. And so when the consumer reads the first element, then there's only n minus 1. That means, that means the bounded buffer has to ask for another element. Huh? It has to again try to stay full at elements. So that's the staying full phase. So this causes us to add a little bit of code. So whenever the consumer gets an element or asks for an element, the buffer has to also ask for another element. So basically when the consumer reads this one, goes to the consumer, the buffer has to ask for this one. Huh? Okay, so it's like this. Whenever the, the buffer is always trying to stay full. Okay. So how do we do that? Well, we have this end pointer variable here, which is essentially bind, bound to the rest of the stream, right? End. So we're going to use end, and we're going to add it as an argument to our loop here. So the loop is each time the consumer reads one element, the loop is going to do one iteration. Huh? Because the loop, when the consumer needs an element, then I will activate this basis suspension. I will bind, uh, uh, the output will be H1. Huh? The H1 will go here to S2. And then I do a recursive call. So each time this loop does one iteration, it means the consumer has asked for one element. Okay. But when that happens, we need to ask the producer for the element. How do we do that? Well, that's very easy. Uh, we have this end variable, but end is going from here. But we need this one. So we do end dot two. That means the end variable has to advance by one. Uh, and this dot operation will cause the the end variable, which has a lazy suspension on the producer, uh, to activate and will force the producer to produce one more element. Okay. So each time the consumer asks for an element by activating, by reading uh, S1, then by doing this, we force the producer to make one new element, to start, at least to start computing a new element. Okay. So with this, the producer and the consumer, the, the buffer will always try to stay full. Whenever the consumer has an element, the, the, this will force the producer to produce another element. And in the ideal case, the buffer will always have n. But some, maybe the producer is very fast, huh? The buffer can empty, of course, huh? If the producer is very slow and the consumer is consuming them very fast, then we have a lot of these n.2s. And the producer is, is, is doing it, but it's not ready yet. But that's OK. The buffer is always trying to stay full, but it may temporarily be less full. Okay. Now, there's one more final step. And this is where we need the threads. So, so far, we're not doing any concurrency yet. But remember, a thread is a unit of weighting. That's another way of looking at that. A unit of weighting. So this code, conceptually, it does everything, except it will block too much. Okay? It waits too much. And there's two places that it waits. The list.drop will, will, will only complete when the producer has made 10 elements. So this one, if I run this, it will, stop, it will avoid the loop from being executed. It will stop the execution of the loop. So the list of drop, it should not wait in the main thread. It should wait in its own thread. Okay? So the, the next step is we put this list.drop in its own thread. That means it still runs and it still asks the producer to produce elements. 
but it's not going to block the main thread. Okay? So remember the concurrency for dummies? Adding threads never introduces bugs. Okay? So I say here, threads are your friends in a declarative program. Threads are very nice. They will never break your program. They will never hurt anything. Uh, you can add them without adding bugs. The effect is that they remove the locking, okay, and make the program more incremental. So in a declarative programming, threads are nice guys. They're your friends. It's not the case in Java. In Java, threads are very nasty because they, they, they when you use them together with mutable states, it's very messy and nasty. But in a declarative paradigm, it's not like that. Threads are very nice and friendly, and you can embrace them, use them wherever you want. So here we will add a thread so that the list.drop waits separately, not in the main thread. So that's good. That means the producer will be getting the end elements, but it won't block the main execution. And then there's another thread we need. This is the end.2. This is the, the staying full part. We need one more element here. But the end.2, again, it will block until end is bound, OK? But we don't want this recursive call to loop to block. So we will put the end.2 in its own thread again. So the recursive loop will just keep rolling, OK? And this one, the end.2, will force the producer to make a new element, OK? Maybe the producer is very slow, takes a long time to produce this new element, OK? That's OK. It will wait in its own thread. It will not block anything, OK? And, and no bugs are introduced. So the, the, the foundation of all of this, of course, is Church-Rosser theorem. Huh? This is all functional. In fact, theoretically, this is all lambda calculus, OK? It's just a different production order. So adding the threads will not change the result. It will just remove the block. So you see how declarative programming is a very different and more powerful way of writing programs than programming in an imperative language, like Java. OK? So that's it. This is the whole bounded buffer. So now I'm done. So you can see it's a combination of lazy and concurrency. So the laziness will make sure that it's only creating elements on demand, okay? And the concurrency is needed to make sure there's no blocking so that the bounded buffer is free to add it, to ask for new elements without blocking the main execution, okay? So it's combining concurrency and laziness, okay? So that's it. Huh? So I will show you the execution, but in a little while after the break, I hope we will show it. So we can create a pipeline with our original producer and consumer. Okay. Now, how does this run when I run it? So when I execute prod, it does nothing. Okay. When I create the bounded buffer, then that immediately asks for three elements from the producer because the size is three here. I make it small. So we can show it. And if I consume an element, so S3, if I do something like browse S3.1, that's consuming an element, then I will add, uh, ask a fourth element from the bounded buffer. So the bounded buffer is always trying to stay full. Uh, and maybe not succeeding, huh? Maybe I'm consuming too fast. But it's okay. It always puts in exactly the threads that are needed to try to stay full. So it converges to full. So if the consumer is not doing anything, the bounded buffer will eventually fill up. Okay? But if the consumer is very, 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 very fast, and the producer is slow, then the bounded buffer will always be basically empty. Okay? But in real life, it's going to be in between those two cases. So sometimes the consumer will slow down, and then the buffer can fill up a little bit. Or sometimes the producer is a little bit faster, or, uh, or the producer slows down and then the buffer will empty a little bit. 
So there's a, it's always some kind of a fluctuation huh? in the real system, but it will smooth the, the fluctuations. Okay. So that is the bounded buffer. That is one of the most subtle algorithms we have seen up to now. Okay. And you can see the principles, huh? Threads are your friends. Laziness lets you work for with infinite data structures. Okay. And you, you have to think in terms of declarative programming. Yeah? So everything you run will always be good, no matter what, if you do it lazy or anything. Okay? Okay, so let me make a small break and then I'll show you the code right now. Write the producer and consumer and show you how the bottom buffer runs. Okay, so I show you that it really works. Okay, it's not just some theory, weird theory stuff, it actually really works. So here's the producer and consumer. Let me uh, keep the same ones. <laughs>
So it takes S1 as input, S2 as the output, so S2 goes to the consumer, and then the consumer is an output S3. So what's going to happen when I run this? So when I run this, the consumer doesn't need anything yet. So I have no S3, S2, I don't need anything. These are all lazy functions. So when I run this, nothing is needed. So what's going to happen? What's going to happen with when I run this? You see what's going to happen in terms of the bump and buffer, right? So is the producer, what's going to happen with the producer? So the consumer still needs nothing. So what's going to happen? You tell me. If you understand what a bound buffer is, yeah? Uh, so it's going to generate three because you passed three. Exactly. It's going to stop there. The bounded buffer will ask for three elements from the producer, then it will stop. Okay. Okay, one, two, three. And it stops. Now, if I want an element from the producer now, let's say I do this. Browse S3.1. So I want the very first element of S3. Notice S3 is unbound. So in order to do this, the consumer needs an element, okay? So it needs an element from S2. So it will ask the bounded buffer for this element. But the bounded buffer already has the element. It's there, one. So it will immediately give the result <coughs> stop waiting. Okay? And at the same time, the bounded buffer will ask the producer for another element to stay full. So I do this. So you see immediately I have, oh, so this is too small. Immediately the ones. Let me make this a little bigger. Okay, so the immediately. I can do it again, huh? you can see how you'll see how it works. So I want now the second element of the output. So the, the cons will do accumulating sum. So we do 1 plus 2. So we'll display 3. Yeah? But this result will appear immediately because the number 2 is already there. It doesn't have to wait one second. See, so the consumer is very fast because the 2 is already there. But then at the same time, at the same time, the common buffer will ask the producer for another element. So, you want, so when I do this, you will immediately see the result. One second later, you will see the bounded buffer filling up again. Okay? Immediately, so you see immediately the result 3 appears, and one second later you see the 5. So the bounded buffer is always trying to be full, but if I ask for too many elements from the consumer, then the bounded buffer will empty completely, and then, then the consumer has to wait, okay? But and because it's so declarative, that's not a problem. So there's no bug. If the consumer has to wait, if the consumer needs four elements now, okay, and the bound buffer only has three, three, four, five, then the consumer will take the first three, and it will wait for the fourth. And it will just wait. So in the very worst case, what can happen is somebody waits. Okay? No bug. It's introduced ever. Okay? So you can play around with this. So I will put this code, but it's easy code, huh? On the, on the Moodle. So it's a very, very straightforward kind of program. Okay. So it, it's, it really works. Huh? So this code is actually <laughs> a good code. Huh? You can use it. Huh? Okay, so let me go back now to the, the course. So you saw the example of execution. Okay. Okay, so let's go on. Let me now show another another nice example. Lazy quick source. Okay. So lazy evaluation can make algorithms incremental. It means since I only ask for things that I need, maybe I only need little bits of stuff to make a result. You know, it asks for the minimum amount, basically, that I need to make the result. And this can enormously improve the efficiency of an algorithm. Because sometimes, when I run the algorithm lazily, it only has to compute a small piece of information. 
Okay? And I will show this with Quicksort, but it's true for many algorithms. Not all, we will see next time. Some algorithms, we cannot make them incremental. Uh, for example, the reverse function. If I reverse the, a list, and if I'm asking for the first element, I want the incremental. The only way to do that is to reverse the moments. So some algorithms cannot be made incremental. But even in the case of reverse, we'll see how to not be, how to avoid the issue, this issue. Okay. So, so it's very, very, very powerful. Okay. So the standard quicksort has a complexity of n log n on average. Huh? It's worst case in squared, but we're assuming if you pick the pivot randomly, then it's n log n. The lazy quicksort, it'll be n plus k log k. So it's basically linear, not n log n, but linear, okay, which is much more efficient. And you, the, the, the log, the, the n log n is only for the elements you compute. Uh, so if I, if I need all the elements, then it will be n plus n log n, as before. Okay, it will be n log n. But if I only need one element, I need the, very, the smallest one, only one, then it will basically be order n. Okay? But if I need some number of elements, it will be k log k. Okay? And as I said before, the value of k does not need to be known in advance. This is a major advantage of lazy programming. You don't have to worry when you design the algorithm how many, how much you will need. It's the same advantage for the having problem. Huh? How many elements do I need of this list? I don't know. But the lazy program will be efficient. Will be always have the maximum efficiency, no matter how many elements you ask for. Okay? Because it's very efficient, huh? the lazy, in terms of memory. Huh? Okay. So this algorithm I will show it to you. And I will uh, make a, a dare you try. I dare you to write this algorithm in Java. Okay, you can do that. You will see the difference. Okay, so quick sort, a quick refresher. Quick sort is one of the uh, uh, one of the standard sorting algorithms. Okay, uh, which uses a divide and conquer approach. So here is the list L. So I pick a random element, which is called the pivot. And I will partition the list L into two lists, one of them where elements are less than the pivot, and another one where they are greater than or equal to the pivot. OK? And then I will recursively call quick sort to have two sorted lists. And since all the elements here are less than this, all I have to do is append them, and the result is uh, done. So you can see this is an n log n algorithm because partition and append will be linear time. And if on average the lengths of L1 and L2 are half, I will have two times operations of half. And if you write the recurrence equation, you see it's an n log n algorithm. Okay? So here's an example. So I can do this on the board. So you can do quick sort. Let me show you just a simple example so you see how it works. Because we're going to make it lazy, so it's an important thing to understand how it's working first. Okay, so we take some list. Uh, whatever. Uh, I take the pivot. So the pivot can be any element, but let me take the first element of the list. So that's the pivot. Then I have L1, which is all the elements less than 3, which would be, uh, let me make this a little bit more. Okay. Less than 5, which would be 2, 4, 0. And L2 is all the elements greater than equal to 5, 6, 8. Five, nine, six. Okay. Uh, is that right? Two, four, zero. Then I do a recursive sort. So when you have zero, two, four, here I do recursively at five, five, six, six, eight, nine. And then I just append them together. 
Okay. Zero, two, four, five, five, six, 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 nine. That's a simple, simple divide and conquer algorithm invented by Tony Horror in the early 60s. Okay. So we implement this. So we implement this declaratively. So basically, I'm going to do a simple version with partition and append. So I will, I will implement a partition function, partition, and an append function. Okay? Okay, partition and append. So here's a partition function. Uh, it's a procedure actually because it has two outputs. So L is my list, original X, X is the pivot, L1 and L2 are the outputs. So I will traverse L, okay? If H is less than X, then I add it to L1. So L1 is H bar N1, and I recursively call it N1. If it's the other case, I add H to L2, and I recursively call it N2, okay? And when I L is nil, then the two lists are terminated. Okay, so it's very simple. Declare the function, it's a linear time function. Okay. And now I have uh, append and quick sort. So append is very simple. So append L1 and 2. So I take the first element of L1 and I do recursive call h bar append t L2. And if L1 is nil, then the result is T2. So this is a simple to recursive append function. Okay. So here is the quick sort. Here then. So a quick sort of L. So for simplicity, I will take the first element of L as the pivot. Uh, you could take another element. Then. L of x bar m, then I will partition L uh, according to the pivot into L1 and 2. I do recursive call quick sort L1, quick sort L2, and I append them, and that's it. Okay? So let me, I want to run this, so let me show you this code now. This case L of H bar T then if uh, H is less than X, then I put it in I put it in L1. So it's 2, 2, it's basically all the elements less than 3, and all the other ones greater than or equal to 3. 
see this, okay? That's partition. Now I have the intent function. Time is actually a built-in function, but let me define it anyway. Case of one of H1, T1, H, T. Is that possible? It's uh, to to write a thread and uh, for S1 and S2 because they don't have to be in their own threads. You could, yeah. Okay. But they don't have to. I mean, this is a sequential quicksort. It's okay because they don't. The quicksort is not blocking them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you could put the the quicksort in this thread. That's the point. Yeah, you could, and it would still be correct. Okay. But it's not needed here. Okay. I mean, yeah, you can do it. You can change anything. Okay, but there's another problem. Assume L has one element, that we have a list of one element. Yes. Then when we do partition, that one element will go either to L1 or L2, right? 
Now we have recursive call, L1 and L2. That means one of those recursive calls will also have a list of one element. See, there's something wrong there, right? The main, if L has one element, then one of the two recursive calls will have one element. So we have an infinite loop. So I don't want to run this because the emulator will go into an infinite loop and have to restart the system. So this is an infinite loop. Okay, you see that? So this is just a little thing for recursive functions. You see why this is wrong, huh? To fix it, so this one is buggy. Let me fix it. So the way to fix it is that the recursive call has to be, has to have an argument that's strictly smaller than the main, <coughs> the argument of the main special function. Huh? That means these two, quicksort L1 and L2, have to be strictly smaller. That means if L is a list of one element, those two have to be zero elements. Otherwise, it's wrong. So the way it's actually easy to fix, instead of partitioning L, let me partition T. So T is guaranteed to have one less element than L. That means L1 and L2 uh, will always have one less element than L, guaranteed. Because in the worst case, one of them is nil, and then all the elements go into the other one. Huh? And it's strictly less than L, so we're good. Now we're not more problematic. But the problem is we've missed the X. So we have to add the X. So we're appending S1 and S2, but there's an X missing. But X should be in the middle of it. Because X, all the elements in S1 will be in less than X. So the X is actually at the end of S1. So we can put it like something like this. So X bar is 2. To make sure we don't forget the X. So now this is correct. Interesting, eh? Small change, but it's important when you can write recursive functions, huh? Okay, so we can try running this one. So we can run that. 
Let me take the pens. So here's the lazy version. I used to call it L of pens. And I can never take it lazy. And also, let me make a lazy quick sort. So I will try to make a nice version, put a nice version of this on the so this is nice because we have two recursive calls here, and they're both lazy. That means only the one that we need will be executed. So maybe we only need one of them and not both. We'll see. So this is the lazy component. Okay. Okay. So let me do something like this. Let me do the same one. Or this one. Oh, you're right. Oh, thank you. My version is actually buggy. Thank you very much. That would have made it not as lazy as I wanted to. So here I have now a truly lazy version. Elephant. Okay. The other one would be partly non lazy and it would give a weird result. But that was a fully lazy one. Huh? Okay. So. How do we do? Well, we have to meet the results. So, so what is the smallest element of, of L? Well, it's S dot 1. Smallest element is 2. What is the second smallest element? Well, it's S dot 2 dot 1. It's also 2. What is the third smallest element? 3. You see that each time I ask for an element, and I can say, what is the smallest? What is the second smallest? What is the third smallest? So here I've asked for three elements. Huh? But the lazy will only do the little extra work. So when I ask for the second one, it does some work already. But when I ask for the third one, it will not redo what it has already done here. It will only do the extra little bit it needs to find out the three, okay? So whenever I need a little bit more computation, it will not redo the previous one, okay? So that's very nice. It seems to work, huh? And you can see how much computation is done. What is the time complexity? We can actually look at the execution. Ooh, this gets complicated. If you actually want to trace through the execution, I even do that. The principle is the following. When I need a variable, I will activate the lazy suspension. But that lazy suspension might not actually bind the variable. It might create new lazy suspensions. But that new one also needs S. Okay? So, so if you look, uh, so let me explain part of this, but you can go through this by yourself. So let's say I do L quicksort 2, 3, 4, 1. And I need the first element. I do browse dot 1, okay? S dot 1 here. So I need S. So I activate these two and this one. If you look at the definition here, if I need S, I will run the body here, so I will call partition, and I will create three lazy suspensions. L sort of element. But the S, the final result, is the result of L append. Okay? So I still don't have a value. So I activate these three, 
but I still don't know what S is. But there's a new lazy suspension attached to S, which is L of N. So S is still needed. Once needed, forever needed. Uh, it's still needed. So it activates the L of N. So when you run L of N, you run the body, so then you go back to the body. When I run L of N, it needs L of 1. Okay, you see, I run the body, it does a case. So it needs L1. So it basically needs S1, which is the first argument of L of N. That will activate this, which is the recursive call to, which is this one, huh? S1 to L quick sort of 1. It will do this. And it will create, it will still not bind S, but it will create a new lazy suspension on S. So S1 is need, still needed. So needed is always true. It's like in declarative programming. When something is true, it stays true. Okay, so L, S1 is still needed. So it activates this L of N. So what it will do is it will need our first argument, which is S1 prime. And finally, that is nil. S1 prime is nil. Finally, we get to something. So we know S1 is uh, one bar S2 prime, okay, because of this. And therefore, we know that it's one bar. S1 prime is nil here. You can see that. Uh, that means the other end, when it runs, it returns the second argument, which is one bar S2, okay. Now oh, this should be an S2 prime. There's a small look in this line. And so the final result is 1 with this element. So it will display 1. So if you follow the execution, you can see it's the same as for having it goes upstream. And, but here we have an interesting thing, a new thing that we didn't see before. When I activate the lazy suspension here, I run the body of the pixel. But the final call is also a lazy function. So the result of activating this lazy suspension is I create a new lazy suspension here. But since the result is still needed, this new lazy suspension will immediately be activated. Okay? So I create the lazy suspension L of n and I activate it immediately. Because I still have no value. The, the, I will keep activating until I bind the variable to value. So as long as I keep creating lazy suspensions, they keep being active. Okay. Okay. Now, what is the complexity of this beast? <coughs> we can. I can. So I'm not going to give a formal proof of it because that's actually complicated. There's a. That was actually in a research paper. There was some Haskell programmer who was very proud that he proved this. But the intuition is very simple. So let's say I have 3, 4, 1. So I will first do partition, and I will get 1 and 3, 4. And let's say I need the first element. Okay? So I first do a partition here, but I need the first element. That means this recursive call of Quicksort will be activated. So again, I will do partition, and I will keep doing the partitions on the left until I get to actual elements, so I will return one with something, and then I'm done. Okay? So basically, when I do a partition, I have two halves. And if I want the first element, I will only continue on the left half, not the right half. But if I need two elements, I will need to do a little bit more. Okay? Three elements, I need to do a little bit more. So basically, I'm dividing the big problem into smaller problems. And if I need k elements, I will, as soon as the partition gives me k, then basically I will do the full execution. So the way to see it is to compute the k smallest element. As soon as the partition gets to the smallest, the k, then I will have to do the full computation, okay? Because I need all the k elements. And that's k log k. So the partition will keep dividing the problem into smaller problems until I get to a problem which is the size that I'm asking for, which is k elements. 
So I will be doing a full quick sort on the k elements, okay? k log k. But the partitions will, of course, take linear time. If you add up these partitions, it's n plus n over 2 plus n over 4, so on. That will be linear, okay? So it's n plus uh, k log k, okay? So n is the partitions dividing, the, making the problem smaller, and k log k is the full mini quick sort for the k elements when I have the smallest, that smallest of k elements, okay? It will actually be a list slightly bigger. It will be the first to n divided by the power of 2 that's bigger than k. Okay. So that gives us the complexity. That's the intuition of it. Uh, uh, you see how it works out. Huh? Partition is making the problem smaller and smaller and smaller. And once we get to the problem of size k, we have to do a full execution. Okay. So the complexity is n plus k. So that's not a formal proof, but that would go too far in this course to try to make it more formal. Okay. So, but you can see intuitively how it works. Huh? The role of the partition is very important. It's dividing the problem into smaller problems. And because the left side is all the elements less than the, the pivot, it's OK. We have actually divided the problem into two separate problems. And we only have to look at the, the smaller list uh, and not the bigger one. So it works fine. So there you have seen some of the magic, a little more magic of laziness. Okay, now there's another part. Now I want to do another part, but I will just start about it. We have seen lots of declarative programming. We've done a bit, quite a bit already, five paradigms. They all give the same results, but in different orders, fast or incremental or lazy. Okay, so we have seen five of them. Sequential, sequential with single assignment, deterministic data flow, lazy, and combining lazy and concurrency. And I'm telling you, they're all declarative. So what does that really mean? Okay. So I want to define a little bit more formally what it means. Okay. And it's all based on church roster, but church roster is not enough. So formally, all functional programs are lambda expressions. And this is what we saw in the previous course. And, and all the odds notation that we use is just syntactic sugar for lambda. Okay? All functional programming is just syntactic sugar for lambda computation. And there is a famous theorem called Church Russell saying if I start from one lambda expression and I reduce it in one way and I reduce it in another way, it's usually there's different ways to reduce. Uh, and we can see that in a concurrent multi-agent program. Huh? The scheduler can reduce it in different orders. So there are different reduction orders. Huh? So if EA reduces to EB and EA reduces to EC, then the theorem says that there exists a term ED, then B and C will go to that term. Okay? They can both reduce to ED. So if it's a terminating computation, then the, 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 the result will always be the same, independent of reduction order. That's a very strong, strong result. And so what is the intuition of that? Well, there, I'm not going to give the proof of it, but the intuition is that each lambda reduction is keeping something true. It's like truth. It's like deduction. When you add truths, then truths, once something is true, it's true forever. And it doesn't matter how you find the truths, you will always end up with the same true things if your system is consistent. Huh? So basically, this is holding for the lambda calculus. Okay? But our scheme does more than just pure lambda. Um, the, the syntactic sugar introduces new ideas, concurrency, streams, so programs that never terminate. Uh, 
single assignment variables. So this is not it's, it's not simple how you determine this in terms of length. So what does this really mean? So what I want to tell you is what uh, declarativeness really means. Okay. And in order to do that, I will have to introduce a little bit of logic. So this is actually nice. I will tell you, give you a, like a quick introduction to first order logic. So I don't know if any of you have already seen logic in another course. Have you seen any logic, first order logic? Does that say anything to you? Uh, with a digital gate. Sorry? Uh, with a digital gate uh, that uh, we have... Uh, but you have seen propositional logic there. Okay. Okay. So in digital logic, you have uh, true, false, and truth okay. tables. Yes. So you saw that. Huh? Yes. So that is a form of logic called propositional logic because you don't have relations, you don't have quantifiers. Yes. Whereas first order logic, you have relations with quantifiers in them. So you can say something like, for all x, px implies qx. So you have relations with arguments and quantifiers. Whereas in propositional logic, you have like something like this. You have only propositional variables which are true or false. So the digital logic here, this is called propositional logic. Whereas this is another more general form of logic where you have quantifiers, you have variables, and you have relations. So this is called first order logic. So you have seen propositional logic, right? In the digit yeah. This is the logic you use for digital search. Whereas if you want to do reasoning, mathematical reasoning, abstract reasoning, you need first order logic. Propositional is not enough for that. So first order logic is much more powerful than propositional logic. So have, has any of you seen first order logic in a course? Yes. You've seen first order logic? Uh, yes. Which course was that? Uh, Mathematics discrete. Ah, you saw again. I have an introduction to first order logic. Has everyone seen that? Yeah. Good. Have you seen proof theory? A little bit. A little bit. Have you seen models? A model of a system of axioms. You seen that? A little bit. Vaguely, you remember? Okay. So you've seen a little. So it's not completely new what I'm going to be saying. So I will refresh a little bit, because logic is very powerful and very important. It's important to understand that. There used to be a course on first order logic, but unfortunately it's not given anymore, uh, which is, I think is too bad. So that's one of the problems, we only have a limited number of courses. So I'm going to give you, as part of explaining what is declared for programming, I'm going to refresh a little bit your memory on logic. So that's, I think, good. Because logic is very important, okay? Not just for programming, again, in general, for math, for reasoning. Okay, so I will do that next week. Let me stop here today. So next week, I will make a little bit of logic, and then we will talk about advanced declarative algorithms. I will show you how to make very smart and efficient declarative algorithms.